Oh, we, actually. <laughs> just the, oh wow, there it is. We <laughs> so, and this is pretend meat. Is is it? June, so just a few minutes ago, Juno came in and she's like, "I don't like this because it's not real meat." She's because she likes Slim Jims. Yeah, real Slim Jims. Yeah. Oh, there we go. All right, well, let's just dive in. Hey, everybody. Welcome to I'm No Expert, <laughs> the, sh- the podcast about everything and nothing. Uh, I'm Ben, uh, joined by Jason Huey of Prometheus Lights and Four Sevens. I hope chewing noises don't bother the arrow. J- right. j- like two seconds before we hit record, Jason said, I'm woefully unprepared. Should we, should we continue? And that is basically status quo for us. Uh, however... He's not unprepared because he does. He did have a meat stick or a faux meat stick, uh, right and that there. is what we are talking about today: is meat. Oh, so, does that sound like meat? <laughs> it sounds like you are beating the. No. Careful, careful. Yeah, this is a. <laughs> if I if we if I continued, then I couldn't hit. I couldn't check the clean box. Yeah, when I family friendly this thing. here. Yeah. Um, Jason, how you doing? First, let's just get the formalities out of the way. How you feeling? How you doing? Nice. T-shirt. I am fantastic, man. <laughs> and I almost mean it. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, we've been off. We've been off a few. Uh, the last week, anyway. We didn't. We didn't record. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's mostly good to be back. I had a migraine for like five days last week. I hope we get into that on this on this call. <laughs> Is it because I didn't eat enough meat? Well, okay. Listen, listen. You, where did we get? Where did we? Why did we even propose meat as a conversation? It came up on Slack, a back and forth, something about the Impossible Burger. Maybe is that what it was? Yeah. So I had I've, I've had them a couple times, um, but it was a maybe two weeks ago. Um, Shannon bought some and we had impossible burgers for dinner. And I was like, Oh my gosh, we should talk about this. Yeah. Uh, and I barfed in my mouth a little bit. Now that's not because of the taste because I too have tried an impossible burger or beyond meat burger. And I did that like, I want to say two years ago, maybe, maybe more, maybe two and a half years ago and grilled them just like I would normal, normal hamburger. Um, found it completely palatable. I dressed it up like I would a regular cow burger. However, where's the butt? Here's the butt. Here's the butt. Simple question. How many ingredients are in meat? Well, one. Correct. I, uh, did you, <laughs> assuming did, that's where you're going, are we counting yes. the antibiotics and growth hormones and all that kind of stuff? We are not because okay. that's not what I eat. Uh, we're going to get into this. This is so good. <laughs> yeah. This is so good. You're you're jumping ahead, but in a good way. Sorry. No, no, it's great. Uh, the Impossible Burger, on the other hand, well, for you know, first of all, I think it just comes back to what I think it was Hippocrates said, and that was, "Let your food be thy medicine." you are what you eat. You know, it's all these all these little clichés that you've heard, but the fundamental sort of truth is that that what you put in your body dictates your health in in such a great way. Wait, is and, that where you are what you eat comes from? I think yes. <laughs> sure, sure. Um yes, and we we live in a weird society, uh a, a weird culture and it is You know, grocery stores, you walk into a grocery store and you can't get to the back where the meat is unless you pass through all the processed foods like this, these, these processed foods, many of which are made using, you know, the corn or soy, which are crops that are subsidized by the government, uh, aka our tax dollars. You know, these are the foods that are cheap. They're plentiful. They're sort of shoved in our face. They taste good as a kid. Like your palate adjusts very quickly to like a processed high sugar food. They also are not good for you. It's not whole food. It's not real food. There's no real nutrients in there. And yeah. um, and so I I when I first ate the Impossible Burger, it was, you know, it was like this messaging. We've got to move away from meat because you know it's bad for you. You've always heard like meat it gives you high cholesterol like there's an association between like heart disease and heart attacks and a big meat diet um uh industrial agriculture like these feed lots are killing destroying the 
the climate and, you know, this meat is bad for you. And some of that is true. Like, yes, you brought up a great point about antibiotics and, um, you know, say cows that are eating conventional feed, which is laced with glyphosate and all the rest, like that's not good for you. But the impossible burger that, so when you read the list of ingredients is quite extensive and it's a highly processed food. It's not like I just killed the cow and, you know, cut off a, a piece of meat there and churned it up into a burger and then threw it on a grill. So what you think is taste delicious, it might be the future of food I look at. And there's a lot of counter arguments now, like there's a big movement back towards a, a like meat based diet, carnivore diet. Ah, uh, like the dinosaurs. That's, the bit, that's old school. That's, yeah. Well, it's old school for humans. I mean, there was a study that just came out of Israel that said that, God, I don't even know how many, however many... Two million years ago, when Homo sapiens first appeared, I think it was two million years ago. I might be totally wrong, but we've been apex, like super predators since the moment we evolved from like Homo erectus to Homo sapiens. Like we have been meat based, and the whole like we are omnivores didn't happen until like 10,000 years ago when we started really doing agriculture, and even, even more recently when we sort of, um, killed much of our prey. We sort of overkilled uh, much of our prey because we're, we are apex predators. But the, but the sort of lesson that this study, this recent study teaches is that we are carnivores. Like first and foremost, we are genetically programmed to eat meat. And it's not until very recently that we've been under this sort of uh, belief that no vegan and vegetarianism is the way to go. It doesn't seem to be true. Oh man, it's a sign of the times. That what? Polarization. The I, two extremes. Dude, I can still sit across from you at a picnic table and enjoy my my meat flavored meat while you enjoy your meat flavored whatever it is. I I mean, that's sort of a different topic. That's like what kind of human being you are. <laughs> <laughs> but I I mean, just the the wild I mean, obviously like veganism is not new. Um Neither is really the idea of eating meat, but just I, I feel like the whole plant based diet thing is still trending. Yeah, very much um, so. Sort of however you handle it. But, you know, if, if we're going to have a like straight meat based diet, I just think it's funny that that's like the exact opposite of totally, that. Totally, totally. Um, I think people are going to need to start killing their own meat, though. Uh, yeah, no, I, well, okay. Why? Go into that. Uh, I think it's it's like too easy, right? Like, where does meat come from? The store. No, it doesn't. It comes from a cute little animal. Like, you should be willing to kill that cute little animal if you want to eat its flesh. Let me counter and say you should have to plant the seed of for celery, grow it, weed the garden, and then harvest it yourself. If you're Oh, no, eat. I'm not saying like, that would be your only source of it. I'm just saying you should at least one time oh. look deep into those brown eyes <laughs> and watch the light fade away. <laughs> By the same token, yeah, you should learn how to grow things so you know how plants work. It's well, okay. So, okay, what one you're of those is about, a, a okay. larger emotional lift than the other. <laughs> so, so okay. There's this, and I want to, I want to dive into this. And, and um, true to form, neither of us have the concrete stats in front of us. So, uh, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm the gonna what? it. It's all gonna come. In. <laughs> it's just what you'll see are gusts of hot air all <laughs> around me. <laughs> the plant in the background is waving. Yeah, that's right. Um, so you're talking about the, I guess, what would you say, like the morality behind it? Uh, like maybe the, eth- is I, the I ethics. I mean, I, I think people should be more in touch with things. So even, you know, even that extends to like building and making things or repairing things. Like I, I think it's important to know where things come from, whether it is your food or your products or whatever. Right. Um, wait, what we just did a podcast on firsthand experience. First, <laughs> firsthand experience. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and agree with you there. 
I'm gonna. Join, oh yeah. I'm gonna, join, I'm, gonna join, I'm gonna join you on this branch. I wasn't sure which direction we were headed. I absolutely do, and I think the reason. Yes, I absolutely do. I think that we should we should all become way more intimately knowledgeable about where our food come from, comes from, all of it. Um, and yeah, and so let's start with meat. Definitely, like people should go and see the various ways that that meat can that that cow, let's just start with a cow, that a cow can start as a calf and become the full grown cow that then gets slaughtered and presented to you in the grocery store as ground meat. Like there are a number of ways that that can happen depending on what meat you're choosing. And I think that let's just start with is a very important, um, like you said, firsthand experience that people should have because you can have the cow that is in a pen its entire life eating commercial grain, which is GMO like corn or whatever that's been sprayed with toxic chemicals and has a miserable life. Or you can find, you can source your meat from like a regenerative operation. A happier cow. Dude, straight up happier cow. And, uh, you know, that's, that is exclusively where I get my meat. I do not buy conventional meat ever anymore. There's, there's farms here. I'm lucky. I'm very fortunate to live in Vermont where it's like I can go down the street to a stand that has an honor system and a cooler and a little um, you know, money box. And I can yeah. just put money in there, write down what I, I grabbed, and I can see the cows wandering the field. And I know exactly how they've been raised uh, and what they're eating because they're eating grass, Vermont grass. Um, but your, you know, the next step is, okay, I'm going to watch that thing, that cow get killed, get harvested, as we say in the hunting world, uh, and, and processed and see how, and see how that feels. Now let's just, let's sort of extrapolate and talk about the, like the vegan or, or vegetable based diet mm -hmm. approach. And what I've come to learn is that much of like the crops, especially the conventional vegetables that you might be consuming, in order to uh, in order for those crops to make it to harvest, there is like widespread slaughter of mice. Like hundreds and hundreds and thousands of mice get killed. You mean in, in terms of pests? Yeah, as, as pest eradication. Uh, and I think that that's important. I think it's something that maybe a lot of vegans and vegetarians don't factor into this sort of ethical um, decision behind their nutritional choices. That's not meant to like sling mud. That's just to say, hey, I, right. see, you, I see you and you like look at a cow and you're like, I could never eat you, cow. You but, just caused a bunch of people to starve to death because now they can't eat anything. Well, that okay. So let's just return to nature and be like, look, if we're like, let's stop separating ourselves from nature and and consider ourselves part of the animal kingdom, and just accept that this is you know we're on the food pyramid and we can be conscious consumers um, on the food pyramid and just go, I want to know where my food comes from. I also want it to be raised ethically and have like a good life. And I want it to eat well because I know that I am what I eat and coming back to your answer, how many ingredients are in meat one, but do you count these other things? And hell yeah, I count those things because the quality of that meat is dictated by whatever that thing ate. So yeah. same thing with chickens. Like I want a free range chicken that's just pecking at bugs and stuff. I don't want something that's eating conventional like commercial corn oh that's yeah. just soaked in glyphosate. Um, yeah. Were you ready for this? Are you are you excited? I'm making notes, man. That's I'm amazing. On fire. I'm gonna pass um, this. I'm gonna pass this back to you. I've been chattering a lot. Well, so. okay. I mean, I think the big thing here that we are circling around is everything is extraordinarily complex, right? In terms of where food comes from and how it gets to be. Um, I mean, it, it is like the cycle of life and you can't break that down into, you know, small chunks. Like I don't, I don't eat meat for ethical reasons. I mean, you can whatever, but stay with me. But so when you bring up the mice and stuff like that, it's like the finer you divide any of these systems, the more problems you're going to find right? Because you've simplified something. Wow, I can't speak today. Um, I mean, say, say, let's just as a thought experiment say, I've, I, I don't eat meat because it is unethical. Well, that is a very broad umbrella. Um, and you might have one or two or three reasons that fall under that. 
where that makes you feel like it's unethical but like the deeper you go the more that branches and at some point you're going to find something that's unethical and then you're going to have to make the decision about whether that's acceptable or not like you you can't be categorical i guess is what i'm saying everything is a compromise um and that makes it virtually impossible to sort of make pure decisions but i mean i think you know we're i don't know if we're talking about environmentalism or ethics or i mean i guess both of those things potentially um but you just you're going to have to make if you want to stay alive you're going to have to make compromises at some point and so you were talking about earlier about all these mice getting killed and this is a weird personal note um but i grew up in montana we we've had a hunting podcast and so i have killed a range of animals um and what i found was the bigger that animal was the less okay i was with it which is fascinating because our our predecessors, our ancestors, millions of years ago, started with the biggest the biggest prey, like the woolly mammoth, and so on, and then worked their way down because it was just it was uh, it made more sense from a, an efficiency standpoint to kill a right. giant thing that would feed you for a lot of time, right, or your whole clan or whatever. But yeah, I'm yeah. talking about emotionally. No, no, no. I know, um, I know. And, it's and, just and part of part of that is I I have to imagine at least you get used to it. Yeah. Right. If you do it enough, but I mean like deer hunting, I used to go um, with my, my friend and his dad all the time. Uh, and I only ever shot one deer, even though I, before that I went on a lot of, a lot of trips. And after that I went on a lot of trips, but I was like, that experience was not something I wanted to repeat. Um, by the same token on our ranch growing up, we used to shoot gophers all the time. And like, I did not have a problem with that. <laughs> But that, but that is there that's a, a clear purpose. You weren't hunting for food when you shot gophers. You were doing no. like a pest control thing, right? Because the gophers Are we being created. Honest? Oh no, you did it. It was for fun. amusement. Yeah, you're a terrible Which, person. I mean, that's that's what people do in uh, Montana at, oh, and other the places where yeah. there are gophers. I <laughs> mean, yes, you. they're in fields, and you're like, oh well, you know, it's to protect the livestock and stuff like that. But no, it's not. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, ethics is complicated and there are like shades of gray. It's not ethical or unethical. Um, and I don't, so, I mean, I wanted to circle back to the list of ingredients. Okay. Um, which I mean, you're suggesting that, you know, meat is simple and yes, the final product is simple, but the inputs to that are not. Um, the impossible burger. I watched a YouTube video, I think produced by them. Um, and they're like, there are only five ingredients in the impossible burger. Here they are. And the guy went into the impossible lab and they're like, yeah, take the ingredients, mix them together and we'll turn it into a burger and eat it. And that was the thing. I'm like, Oh, that's pretty impressive. So earlier you may have heard me typing. I looked up the ingredients and the main ones are water, soy protein, coconut oil, sunflower oil, natural flavors, which (laughs) is a made up marketing thing. And then 2% or less of a bunch of these other things. A Um, bunch of these other things. Well, I mean, potato protein, methyl cellulose. Don't know what that is. Yeast, dextrose, food starch. Right. No. And so, you know, salt and then a bunch of like vitamins and stuff, which I'm okay with that. So, I don't know what those things are or where where they come from. And this is a terrible podcast. You're selling Um, it. You're selling it. You're selling the burger. Go on. No, Well, but so methyl cellulose, is that just a scientific name for something simple and basic that I don't have a problem with? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, But there are a lot more than five ingredients or whatever it is. Um, but are any of those things terrible? Like, I don't know. They seem relatively okay to me. As a layman, just looking at this list, except for methyl cellulose and so, cultured dextrose. I mean, dextrose is a kind of sugar. So is that a big deal? I don't know. 
Um, so methyl, methyl cellulose is a chemical compound derived from cellulose. It is a thickener is and emulsifier. Fiber. Yeah, it's a thickener and an emulsifier that's used in food and cosmetic products. Does it say where it comes from? It is not digestible, not toxic, and, and they say not a, uh, an allergen. Um, so, 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 I mean, it, cellulose is like what plants are made of. Yeah, I guess. Like paper is cellulose. Yeah. Um, so essentially methyl, you're eating yeah, paper. Me- methyl cellulose is just a chemical derived from cellulose. Yeah. So S- again, I don't know. We need an expert, Ben. What, <laughs> what, um, in the sort of handful of folks in this like carnivore diet space, uh, some of, some of whom are doctors, medical doctors, uh, what they are pushing hard against so in their in their sort of carnivore diet and there's one that's going on right now it's all meat april uh, this guy paul saladino carnivore md uh who i've started to follow a lot um has like his own you know food pyramid and the things that you want to avoid at all cost and these are the things that he claims and i'd have to find the studies that he's citing to back this up but that it is the seed oils that are found in so many processed foods and that people often end up using to cook as a medium yeah. for heat transfer to cook. Those are like the things that you need to eliminate from your diet. And so what you look at really? the second ingredient in impossible burgers is coconut oil. And then the third is sunflower oil. Third so and you, fourth. Third, Water is the oh, first. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, third and fourth. Thank you. <laughs> Just- um, and if you started to look at, if you started to look at, uh, you know, your foods that are, you know, more, your more processed foods, like boxed foods, take a look at what is in those, even like your mayonnaises and some of those like condiments, you will find that probably the majority of them have as one of their first, second or third ingredients, some sort of seed oil. Those are highly processed. And Wait, why is that bad? I, I don't know the science. Just because it's to, so processed? No, I think it's also what it's doing to your body. I don't think it's meant to be – and I don't think it's a food that's meant to be ingested by your body. And I think that what they're claiming – again, I have to look this up. I need to do more research. What about The listener should oil? do more research. Yeah, olive oil too. Like these, these are the things that are causing uh, a lot of the health issues in America. So What? Yeah, it's in everything. So that and Man. sugar. So that and like sugar being the other one that, you know, everyone should really just eliminate from their... Well, sugar we know, but I mean, everyone's like, olive oil is good for you. Does that mean we can only cook with butter and and bacon grease? There you go. So that's what I've switched to. I actually buy uh, lard from this local farm. I cook with that. I cook with butter, ghee, which is like a clarified butter. You lost me until you said local farm there. And then... um, (laughs) And then bacon fat. So when I cook yeah. fat from when I cook my bacon, I save it and I have it in a little thing, and I, you know, I, I filter it, and then that's what I that's what I cook with. I try, I'm trying to be. I'm actually on this thing. This all this all mm-hmm. meat April. I'm on day seven. I wow. have had. How I've are had you feeling? Steak and eggs. It's like an animal base, so it's not literally all meat, but you you know, majority of it is meat, and you want your base of your pyramid to be like ruminant meat. So you know, from cows. Then you've got like pigs and chickens. Um, f- uh, vital to this way of eating is is eating the organs as much as you can like the livers and the kidneys like these are basically nature's um multivitamins which in which i think is more okay in a naturally raised animal than a farm raised animal because i mean those organs tend to uh accumulate yeah and accumulate the bad stuff I, i can't impress upon the listener the importance of of um selecting your foods appropriately like if you can if you can afford it well here's the thing you can afford it move to switch to organic foods and if you're buying meat like try to buy grass-fed free range because like the quality of that meat the nutrients in that meat are going to be so much higher than the conventional and you're not going to have the toxins and a person might say, well, those things are too expensive. Well, one, like the reason we have more organic food in the grocery store now is because people started demanding it. And so people switched. They recognized that this is where people want to go. So we're going to see more organic foods. And that is going to lower the cost eventually as more operations switch over to organic. Two, you pay for it now or you pay for it later. 
is basically what I think. You can pay up front Like now. in hospital bills. Exactly. Exactly. And people, it's hard. It's very hard, I think, to trace that, to link those two things. There's no like, I fell and I broke my leg because I, I hit that stone, you know? Like, well, it's very easy to point to that stone and be like, that's what caused me to break my leg. But you get, you know, cancer or heart disease down the road or diabetes. It's like, where along the line, you can't point at the one thing, but you can. You got to look at like your the food you're putting in your body, and it just comes back to that Hippocrates: "Let food be thy medicine." And we've we've moved away from it, but we've also been pushed away from it in this society because the crap food is also the cheapest food, and we've also been sold a lot of lies, like fat free. The whole fat fat free fad. Fat is the most nutrient dense food that exists on the planet. Like it's the best thing that we could eat for ourselves from a nutrient standpoint. So the fat in a in a freshly slaughtered deer or you know your your steak like that's not necessarily something part. to be pushing yeah mm. it's the most it's not the thing to be pushing off your plate i think the fat fat free fad what ended up happening like fat free yogurts or whatever take that for an example they just replaced it with sugar who's the it's it's a i don't know maybe it's a youtube series it's like somebody ruins everything <laughs> I don't Have know. You heard this? No. It's this guy, and it's it's like a science based comedy thing where the oh, I can't can't believe I don't remember what his name is. Anyway, he ruined his whole thing. Is he ruins things like low fat, like Danny ruins low fat or something? Yeah. But so I just saw this maybe a couple weeks ago, um, and I did not fact check it, but it sounds plausible. So. Basically, what you're saying is back in the day, the sugar lobby essentially took over the industry and they were like, we want to tell people fat is bad and we want to sell them sugar yeah, because that's what we manufacture yeah. and sell. But yeah, so the way they make or low fat things, they take the fat out and it doesn't taste good. So to make it taste good, they re- replace it with sugar, right. which is arguably much worse for you than actual fat. And that's been a whole generation. Like my my mother is still on the fat free thing. Like if she's gonna buy something, she's gonna buy the fat free. And like looks at me when I'm cooking with butter and putting butter and everything. She's like, Benjamin, you're gonna get fat. And I'm like, No, I'm not, because I don't eat sugar. Like I'm going yeah. the other way. Yeah, grandma. But it's it gets ingrained in you. I mean, that was an entire generation of like just propaganda, fat free, fat free, and and it takes like a decade or more for the true science to come out, if it does at all. Um, you know, you saw it with cigarettes, man. Like doctors saying, like I choose Pall Mall; it's the best thing for you. It's toasted. It's just like there are lobbies that stand to profit, and it is hard to cut through all the noise. And I'm not saying, I'm not here saying like, I know 100% that this like carnivore diet is the way to go. Cause there's also uh, a school of thought that says your genetics should or or can dictate your best diet, you know, like where your ancestors came from. Like if you uh, have a lot of Scandinavian in you, you should maybe be eating as the Scandinavians do and did, you know, thousands of years ago, which would be like fish and whale blubber. Yeah, whale blubber. (laughs) Um, But I also think that that's a more recent in the grand scheme of our species, a more recent phenomenon like geographic, geographically based diets. Whereas everything beyond that is we were just meat. We were eating meat, like wherever you can get meat. And yes, fish too. Uh, and and the other argument against vegetables is that a lot of like leafy greens and their vegetables that are just much more toxic, like they're just more toxic. If you compare, you know, like a conventional kale versus a, uh, you know, some ground beef that came from a regenerative farm, like it's no contest, which is the cleaner source. But you're of talking food. about how both of those things were grown, yeah. not. Not no, 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 not inherent. Product. No, not the inherent toxicity. Although, as it pertains to kale, I was listening to, I think I mentioned this guy, Zach Bush. He's a doctor. He's like a triple board certified, freakishly genius guy who's gotten really involved. He was, he, he was, came up through like the allopathic, like traditional medicine, and now is heavily invested in, um, in a bunch of, nonprofits and for-profits that are trying to get farmers to go back to regenerative farming to restore soil health. And where were we going with this? 
Oh, kale. So he did kale. He, he did this. Uh, it was like a study in a food desert down in like Alabama or something. So this is a a population of people who really don't have access to vegetables, like good organic foods, and they're you know they're buying foods at the mobile mart or wherever introduced kale into their diet, like even good kale, and they were having serious digestive issues and were actually showing like worse outcomes health-wise. And that is because their guts were so destroyed and leaky that they couldn't properly break down and process kale, even in organic kale, because kale, I guess, is kind of difficult for our, our digestive systems it's to break down anyway. probably a lot of cellulose anyway. in it. Yeah. And so they were having like particulates of this kale leaking into their bloodstream and causing all sorts of like downstream health issues. Well, that's so even not before, the fault of kale. No, that no, is... but that's, that's the terrain. So that's the... Yeah. Even before, like, so a person who is going from, okay, I recognize that I've been eating a lot of sugar and processed foods and I want to switch over, might switch over to organic kale, make this like drastic switch and then go, why am I feeling worse? And it's because, holy crap, you've got a whole bunch of things you got to sort of fix before that, um, before you make that switch. Well, so this sort of sets off my scientific method bells. Um, were there other vegetables involved in this study that's a good question i don't know i have to find it look man this is hot look at that thing is those leaves are moving they are moving in the air there okay? is a lot of hot air okay uh, no i mean so sure <laughs> like what about lettuce i don't know or no, spinach no, yeah 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 it's it comes back to your it comes back to your point that it is like it can get so complex it can get yes, so it exactly. can get so complex but i, I think, mean and yeah I, Thank you for bringing that up again, because even, you know, as we're talking and I'm also imagining the people who have stopped listening to this podcast, <laughs> um, like it's just complicated and you have to like go down all of these different paths, maybe that you don't want to go down and find out things that you don't want to know and then take a step back and look at all that information and be like, okay, now what do we do with it? Sure. Um, so yeah, maybe kale is like the worst thing to put in front of somebody who doesn't normally eat vegetables because it's hard to process and their body is not used to processing it. So let's don't do that. Right. Uh, but in a different situation, it is, you know, totally fine or nutritious or whatever. Um, but I mean, I think like where that, <laughs> like if, if that is actually a big health problem, somebody needs to study if you have been eating a diet that does not contain much fresh fruit, fresh fruit, fresh food, got it. If you've been eating a diet that does not contain much fresh food, nailed it. What should you eat in order to comfortably and successfully introduce those foods? Like, yeah, that's where that needs to go. Making that, how do you make that transition? And I would imagine, uh, I, I'll put my doctor slash nutritionist hat on, um, which I just have handy, that you would want to get a test, like some tests done to determine if your gut, I mean, like leaky gut syndrome is one of these things that's out there now. It's yeah, like, I don't, I, what, I, I was like, what is that? Yeah. So, okay, that's crazy that you don't know what it is because it's it feels like it's a condition that now gets sort of just thrown out a lot, like diagnosed a lot. And I, I don't know what that test looks like. I, I believe that there are some pretty concrete, te concrete tests to determine if essentially like your gut, if the lining of your gut has become porous and the foods that are supposed to stay in your intestines and get processed start leaking into your bloodstream and cause all sorts of inflammation and autoimmune issues because your food doesn't, isn't supposed to like leak from your gut into your, uh, into your bloodstream, right. into your body. And this is caused by, you know, processed foods. I think glyphosate is a big culprit. A lot of the chemicals and toxins that get sprayed over our GMO crops. Like, this is not stuff that we're meant to be consuming. And I think that this can contribute to what is called a leaky gut syndrome. Right. I think I it mean, gets thrown out and overdiagnosed. But this, this is the whole environmental argument. Because um, there, <laughs> there are going to be people that are like, oh, this whole organic thing is garbage. Whatever. And like, I, I just, I'm trying to picture a scenario where it's better to do the worst thing. Like there's no negative impact from not putting chemicals into your body. <laughs> right, right. 
Exactly. There's no negative, and I know, I know I'm using a double negative. Deal with it. There's no negative impact to not polluting. Yeah. There's no negative impact to not wasting. Yeah. Unless the cost. So given the op- it- Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally cost. But so, given the ability to do those things. Yeah. Like, why not just have less impact? It's. I mean, and we like I do this at work. Right. And I, I think machinists are some of the biggest misers on the planet because waste is literally losing money. Yeah. Right. And so we do everything we can to minimize waste, partly because I just don't believe in wasting, partly because it makes financial sense. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure where my point went, but maybe I made it. No, no, you you said it. Like, there's there's no harm in doing these things. Like, there's no negative outcome from switching to organic that we know of. Right. But and I mean, I guess. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go on. No, there's there's potential or clear negative outcomes from not switching. Right. One of the two. And even even if you are unclear, like if there's the potential for it, why not make the other choice? Like you said, cost is often yeah the biggest factor and accessibility. Um, Sometimes people and accessibility. Can't get sure. organic foods where they are or good meat, you know? Um, so now we've gotten back in, to the point where it is far too complex for us to sort out in the next 10 minutes. That's not true. Um, we'll get there. But yeah, I mean, accessibility is a huge issue. And that's what a food desert is, right? Where you don't have access to fresh, unprocessed food. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of cost and short-term planning because it's very easy to be like oh well you're just thinking in the short term but if you don't make that much money you've got to spend what is available to you that week and you may have to buy the cheapest food that you can so you can survive right like literally have some kind of energy Um, and it is i think an unfortunate circumstance where our system is set up to provide the lowest nutritional value at the lowest price. Correct. So like that, you know, and, and this is where that part gets complicated. I don't know how to solve that. Um, but somebody should be trying to figure that out. Right. And it's definitely not the companies, the very large corporations that are making this stuff because they're making money on it and they're, they're not interested in your health no. or your well being. That's an important point. That's a very important point. Th- uh, your health is not their priority. The bottom line is their priority. Right. And I mean, I feel like you can take that as lip service where you're like, oh, corporations are just out to make money. I mean, that is true. That is literally what a public company is supposed to do is make money. But like there is no incentive for them to care about your health. Like unless that is part of their mission. Yeah. And they do it for no other reason than they feel that that is important. There's no reason for them to care. Yeah. So it would it would be a mistake, I think, to believe that they do. Anyway, I I mean, we you know, we as there he goes. What is so what is so that's not meat. What is in it? What what, what brand is that? Well, we've just been exploring this not meat thing. Um, somewhat out of curiosity i don't know what brand it is shannon ordered like a sampler box of things okay. where they're like try our not meat you might like it <laughs> and you don't mind it i mean sorry i'm trying not to chew too loud you should chew loud this is like a slim jim right yeah i don't know what they put in that but it can't be good for you <laughs> objectively this is not terribly different like i don't know it tastes kind of spicy slim jims have a manufactured texture anyway yeah in the like weird hard outside casing it's very similar in terms of like the experience of it i mean it's chewy in a gross way just like slim jims are and it's got some spices and stuff in it. I think if you gave this to someone, they may not necessarily like the flavor, which is true for any meat stick. Um, 
I don't think anyone would be like, this is definitely not me. I'm big on the double negatives today. I think I could pass this off to a hardcore carnivore as a meat stick and they would not know the difference. That would be a fun, that would be a fun YouTube video. Just the corner, corner of the street taste test. Yeah. And it's funny because the first bite I had of it, I was kind of like, ooh, which I, again, I think many meat sticks I have that response to, but like I took a couple more bites and I'm like, yeah, I don't know. It's fine. It's fine. I'll eat this. Yeah. Um, where, where's our time? 40 uh, minutes. Yeah. Do you want to circle back to the impossible burger? Cause that's what started this whole thing. Sure. Um, oh, I have, I'm going to throw out my random tidbit now though, which is not related to the impossible burger. We talked about earlier. You are what you eat. Okay. Uh, have you ever been trout fishing? Uh, yeah, I've been like once or twice, like caught them, handled them. What does a trout smell like? fish i don't know i don't remember you would think it does but it does not it smells like bugs uh because it eats bugs and i again i used to live in montana they don't have bugs in california but if you live somewhere where there are lots of bugs you're i don't i don't even know about vermont but like you are constantly scraping them off your windshield we got a lot of bugs and sometimes, you know, you'll drive through a hatch of bugs. I remember this one time I was driving, I think from here up to Sun Valley, Idaho. Uh, and there's this very famous fishing stream called Silver Creek. And it was like just at sunset, I was driving through. And I think there was a caddisfly hatch, maybe. There are millions of these things. And I'm going like 75 <laughs> miles an hour down this country road. And it is literally like rain shame on you just Just like wipers going wiping like so much like i couldn't even see and so i like literally had to slow down and drive like you know 20 miles an hour so i could see um and but so when (laughs) my point is when you get out of the car and you clean those bugs off your windshield it makes that smell that dead bug smell and that's what trout smell like that's amazing isn't that weird yeah I'm not sure I've ever told that story before. <laughs> I will now be way more aware next time I trout fish. Yeah, no, uh, it completely smells like trout. That's so cool. Um, oh, impossible burgers. Yeah. So I, I have had an impossible burger just recently. I've had them a couple times before. Uh, there's Beyond Meat also. Yeah, 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 yeah. Between the two, I would say not a comparison. The impossible burger is great. Beyond Meat, no thank you. Okay. Um, And I don't know how much of that is flavor, definitely a texture thing. Got it. Um, And I also think with the Impossible Burger, if you served it to somebody and did not tell them, they wouldn't know. That's what I'm interested in. That's what I'm interested in 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 discovering. Especially one of these carnivore people. You said you had one before. Do you know which one it was? I uh, let me look up a picture and it'll. It... The impossible stuff looks much. I mean, it looks like ground beef. Yeah. So it's be, what is it beyond? It was the beyond meat is what I had. Yeah. See, that one's not good. Okay. You should try an impossible burger. The weird thing is, is it's pink. Yeah. Like ground beef. Like it literally looks like ground beef and the yeah. texture and everything. Um, you don't need to cook it though because it's plant based. But when you do cook it, it browns right like a burger. Right. You can cook it medium or rare or well done because it's pink and it changes. It's it's fascinating, um, and I mean I think the flavor is good. Like different burgers taste different. You know, sometimes you put stuff, mix it in with the ground beef. Yeah, I don't flavor. I don't do that anymore. If you roll like that. Um, and like the texture and the mouthfeel and everything, it's like, it, it's even like you can buy it in patties or you can just buy it in like chunks and use it like ground beef. Yeah. One of the problems I have with most like veggie burgers and stuff like that, or, or the Beyond Meat, is it is a very precise finished product. It looks too precise. And okay, some ground beef patties also look like that, I guess. But there's a little bit of a regu- irregularity in a normal burger patty. 
And the the impossible burger has that. It's just playing off all those senses. Yeah. How can we mimic ground beef? As I mean, and I also have to say, I think substitute meats are a stupid idea anyway. <laughs> like if you don't want to eat meat, just don't eat it. Don't like right. take a bunch of other stuff and then pretend that it's meat. Why would you do that? I guess like, because people miss drives they, me crazy. They miss that mouthfeel, you know, and that fat and the juice. Then and, eat meat. Uh, yeah, they don't want they don't want to kill Bessie. I'm sorry for shouting. They don't want to kill Bessie. Um anyway, so you should try an impossible burger. I will do it for you. I know that's a, an interruption to your diet. No, I won't do it this month. <laughs> Or it's not an interruption. I so anecdotally, well, number one, I think that you and I should revisit this as a review. Mm-hmm. We can review, uh, you know, maybe we do like an impossible burger, a beyond meat burger, a like grass fed, you know, organic mm. meat, um, a conventional, and then maybe we just do throw in like a McDonald's burger just for the heck of it. They're all that's good. A, that's a lot of burgers. Except for some of the plant based ones. Yeah. That's a it's lot like, of burgers but we'll do it. It's kind of like pizza. Yeah. Like a burger has to be pretty bad. Yeah. To yeah. be a bad burger. It's true. Or you just like, like I will it. accept a wide range. Yeah. Yeah. Basically it has to be burned. Other than that, like, I don't know. It's fine. Like it's ground beef and whatever you choose to put on it. Like, yes. So, okay. So let's, let's go back to, First of all, I'm I'm down. I will do an impossible burger absolutely for the sake of science and the firsthand experience. I am definitely all about it. Um, that's the spirit. That's the spirit. I'm also I feel like a fairly serious meat person, right? So for me to be like an impossible burger is totally good. Yeah, I will say anecdotally, anecdotally, and I'm only seven days into what is a this animal based thirty or carnivore diet. Uh, And I'll tell you um, that most of my meals have been some form of steak grilled uh, with sunny side up eggs and maybe like, oh, it's so good. And then, uh, you know, maybe some avocado or like one of the acceptable like fruits or vegetables on the side. Wait a minute. No grains, no grains, like no rice, no flour, no breads, no no processed foods. And I'm doing that for like breakfast. I'm doing that for lunch. I'm doing that for dinner. It's been a lot of steak. Wait, are you eating the same thing? No, I'm trying to I'm trying to make get some variety in there. Okay. I mean, so there's meat, any kind of meat, right? There's eggs. Yeah. Avocados. What else can you eat? Well, yeah, chicken. I mean, you can do chicken, you can do all the organ meats, you can do all the fish. You know, as long as you don't yeah, want like high mercury. Yeah. That, yeah. Okay. I covered that. Oh, that's a lot though, Jason. Let's, let's just talk about the various ways that one can prepare all of those types of meat. Yeah. Um, so eggs, you know, butter, uh, ghee, I mentioned you can do if you can tolerate it like dairy products. So, mm-hmm. you know, we, I've got raw milk. That's the other amazing thing. There's a farm that's nearby that delivers raw milk, which is like another na- nature's multivitamin. Um, and yeah, some fruits and some vegetables and berries, and that's it. You're not supposed to eat nuts, like no seed oils, no, no processed food. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure exactly why I haven't like read the book yet on why. I've just been, okay, you tell me not to eat nuts, so I'm going <laughs> to... I, I like uh, sort of cut them out. So that's it, man. It's like steak <clears throat> and eggs. Like I've been doing steak and eggs and then you know mixing in some All other right. stuff. Well, I'm definitely curious to get the 30 day report. Let me go let me go back for a second. So and so just anecdotally, uh I feel freaking I feel good. Like I have high energy throughout the day as long as I'm making sure that I eat. And the and I I fell off of this briefly Sunday night because my mom had sent a package for Easter to my uh, to my son and there were cookies in there and I was like I don't want him to eat them. So you took you took cookies away from your kid. Yes. For his benefit. Correct. For his benefit. Okay. And it was for only four cookies, but uh-huh. I ate them all on a Sunday night. And then Monday, that that morning, that day was like my low energy day. And I was like, oh man, maybe like I there must be some maybe there's something to this. But I've been pretty faithful otherwise, and I feel freaking good, like high energy. We'll see what happens after 30 days. But so far, I don't feel like brain fog. I feel the opposite. I feel like clarity. Right. I mean, 30 days, I feel like is long enough to get a feel for it. 
like yeah. if there is actually any true <clears throat> change in the way you feel. Yeah. 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 Like if you did it for a, a week, no, but 30 days is agreed enough time for your body to either give it the thumbs up or the thumbs down. So the, so the, um, the sort of last thing I want to throw out there into the conversation and it's our bonus, uh, bonus, like show note, not our maker minute, but our bonus show note, um, is, you know, learning a lot more about how our food systems, particularly in this country, uh, are so closely tied to like soil health, personal health, and then climate, like our ability to capture carbon. And, uh, the documentary that I would encourage everyone to watch and probably maybe some of you have is kiss the ground. And I think it's on Netflix, um, re- exploring regenerative farming and farms that are moving from, you know, their mono cropping over to regenerative and what it can do not only for like biodiversity and healthier crops and animals that you sort of have to have as part of that process. But also when you, when you do that, you create, um, a much more, Diver- biodiverse soil, which is one of the most effective carbon captures that we have available to us. And the converse is that these like um, monocrop, like, you know, fields of corn, fields of soy, fields of wheat that get sprayed with pesticides that are like GMO crops sprayed with like Roundups end up desiccating and the, so- the soil and destroying the micro diver- uh, diversity in that soil, biodiversity in that soil and turn yeah. the soil into dirt. Essentially like desertif- desertifying, I think is the word, um, all our farmland. And mm-hmm. this, I don't know if it was this documentary or back to Zach Bush, one of them basically said, if we continue this, go down this path, uh, we have 60 harvests left on this planet. We have 60 years left on this planet before all of our like soil turns to, to desert or to dirt, basically. And so the, and not only chemicals, not, more chemicals, ben. yeah, just more chemicals. And so I look at it and I'm like, okay, what little steps can we take to, um, to, to transition our food system back towards something that's a little healthier. And for me, it's like, okay, I have this opportunity. It's more, it's more expensive to buy this kind of meat. It's more expensive to buy this kind of like fruits and vegetables, but I either pay for it now, I pay for it later. And also I feel like maybe this is a great way to do my part to help, you know, reverse like climate change and revert and, and reverse the desertification of our land and our soil. Um, I don't know, whatever. I'm just saying, go, go watch kiss the ground. It changed my, it changed my perspective and I cried. Oh, good. (laughs) That's always a selling point for me. Um, I mean, so on the next podcast, I, should we talk about why, uh, Indoor agriculture is the only way to save humanity. Oh, God. Uh, yes, because no. <laughs> what? No? I, I, okay, we'll get that. Yep. I know. Well, that's not Next time. I can't wait. Next time. This is so awesome. I, uh, I got to say. I also good. want to revisit the lettuce grow, which yes. we talked about on a yes. previous episode. Okay. So okay. that'll be a good time to do that as well. Awesome. Um, kiss the ground. That's not our maker minute. From I, I put the maker minute out there. I threw it on the document. You and I, you and I didn't even get to talk about it. But this guy uh, at Carnivore MD, Paul Saladino MD. Uh, this is where I was like basically kind of first introduced to the whole concept of a carnivore diet. Not first introduced, but when I sort of took my deep dive. Um, really appreciate this guy and his perspective. He went and he lived with the Hadza hunter gatherer tribe in Tanzania, which is like the la- one of the you know last existing hunter gatherers. And, and they don't eat almonds. They do funny, funny enough, they don't drink almond milk. They're like nose to tail, 90, you know, 90% of their diet is is meat. It's like they will slaughter a goat, hunt something, and they will eat the entire thing. He's big on this nose to tail. So eating the organs, mm. like blood stew, you know, all of it. And they are healthy. They don't have disease. They'll eat some like wild bee honey and maybe a little bit of tubers, but um, otherwise it's like straight meat. Anyway, it was awesome. It was cool to see like his videos sitting around a fire, like just learning their culture, appreciating their culture. But anyway, Carnivore MD, go check him out, see what you think. Um, and I don't know, anything else you want to say, Jason? I know you do. You always do. I don't want to sign off yet. I'm writing down. Maybe Carnivore you don't. MD. Um, I, I mean, I am curious to watch that because I like 
uh, learning things. But my science bells also ring in terms of causality. How can you attribute diet to health when there are so many other potential factors? Like it would be different if you took a bunch of modern people and only fed them meat for, you know, 10 years. Yeah. Um, but if, if this is a tribe living out somewhere, their their entire environment is so vastly different that how can you just attribute their health to diet? Anyway. Sure. Um, oh, my last thing is not what you might think. Um, Adam ruins everything. Okay. Is the guy that you need to look up and we can maybe put that in the show notes as well. Okay. I mean, it, it's there. All the videos are funny. Um, and they're also sort of like sciencey debunking kind of videos. And you can fact check them if you feel like it. Uh, I mostly enjoy the content. <laughs> so check it out. Adam ruins everything. We'll, we'll put a link in the put a link in the show notes. Um, I'm hungry. I'm Ben. I'm going to go make a steak. I'm not an expert. And I appreciate you, Jason, uh, indulging me on this one. Absolutely. It was fun. I'm no expert. And I'm not eating a meat stick right now. It's a something else stick. We'll talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.